All right, let's talk right now. Um, our second data basics lecture, let's talk about how to represent groups of numbers non-graphically. So let's get started with that here. Uh, the learning objectives for here is to understand or to understand non-graphic representation of groups of numbers. There are lots of ways to do this, but we're going to look at a few. And after you figure these out, you can probably figure out the rest. Very easy is a data column. And then a frequency table, a little more complicated. A grouped frequency table, slightly more complicated. And then a data matrix, which is actually a little less complicated than that, but is used a lot to represent our data in computers. But in a data matrix, you need to be able to uh, find individual observations, identify variables in columns, identify uh, responses from a single individual in the rows. So let's talk about some terminology to get things straight here. When we have many similar observations coming from a group of things or events or people or something like that, then the things or events are something that we are looking at, that we are observing or listening to or touching or whatever. We call them cases. Sometimes we call them individuals or, or the people who came from them, we call them individuals or subjects, uh, sometimes abbreviated just with a capital S or SS if it's subjects, sometimes participants. Those are all really similar, if not identical things. The characteristic that we're measuring there is called a variable. We talked about that a little bit two lectures ago. One characteristic measured across a whole bunch of fairly similar individuals is a variable. If the variable is measured on a numeric or numerical scale, I don't actually know the difference between numeric and numerical, so I will use them interchangeably, then all the values together are called sometimes called a distribution. So we could say, what's the distribution of IQ in these 52 school children? We could say, what's the distribution of oil prices, etc. We're especially likely to use the term distribution when we're not just talking about the group, but we're looking at a pattern of groups. So we say, if this distribution is positively skewed or skewed towards uh, high prices or something like that. So let's remember this principle. It's pretty critical. The nature of the data determines the treatment of the data, which means most of what we're about to talk about should not be done with categorical data. You could do some of it, but the results will be silly. Actually, there's one thing at least that is perfectly OK to do with categorical data, but I'll mention that when we get to it. Let's talk about how we represent uh, numbers. We need to organize them because most people do not enjoy looking at a wall of numbers. Some people do. Um, one way to organize numbers is just to write them in a column. Now, often this is how we record data. If you're out there in the field, I would recommend you get in this habit. If you're recording your own data for a class presentation or something and you're doing it by hand, type things in a vertical column. Put the name of the variable at the top. If you don't know what the name of the variable is and you press for time, just write X. And just start writing what comes in as it comes in. Now, the column is nice because then if you want to go back later and write the names of the pretty birds that you gave values to, or if you want to write the heights of the people who you got these SAT scores, you can just write them next to the values. So a column is a pretty flexible thing, even though it looks pretty simple. Sometimes we order or sort the column, but we need to be careful of that. Uh, if it's paired up with any other data about the observations and the individuals the observations came from. Now, a column of data doesn't go very far in helping us understand what's actually going on. So when we represent data and organize it and kind of summarize it in certain ways, we're trying to see patterns in the data. We're trying to see um, trends, patterns, the organization of the data itself. We organize it a certain way, and we want to see the inherent organization. So a frequency table is an extremely common and easy way of organizing data. Uh, all software can do it. In R, the function is a really simple function. It's just table. So if you have a variable called x, you just type table, and then in the parentheses you do x, and it'll show you a frequency table. So the way to do this is you list each possible value from your data. Those are what we call the categories. Don't leave any gaps if it's a numerical sequence or even an ordered variable sequence. And then, right beside that, you list those in a column usually, although you can do it in rows. But right next to each possible value, you write the number of times that value excuse me, showed up in your data set, even if that number is 0. So for instance, if you don't have any 7s, but you have 6s and 8s, still write a 7 in the possible values. But then when you get there, write 0 to show that there were no 7s in your data. Uh, this is called frequency. The frequency is the number of times a certain value appears. 
and we just usually abbreviate it F. It's an extremely common thing to write in charts or tables or anything like that. And also, this particular thing works very well for either numerical or categorical variables. It doesn't matter. Either one's fine. If it's ordinal or numeric, however, then the categories have a natural order to them, so please put them in order in, in the frequency table. So here's an example um, of some data that's just written down in a column that continues across three columns, actually. Let's say this is just the date, the order in which it came in. A bunch of students were asked whether their tuition money was well spent, and they were given these five standard choices from a Likert scale to respond. So what level of measurement is this? Is this numerical? If it's numerical, is it continuous or is it discrete? Is it categorical? If it's categorical, is it ordered or is it nominal or unordered categorical? So here's a frequency table of those values. If you look back, you'll see that there are exactly five possibilities represented there. Now, if you did the research, you'll know exactly how many possibilities there are. But if you didn't do the research, sometimes you have to kind of reverse engineer and figure out what the possibilities were. So looking at this table, you can see that 10 people said they strongly agreed. 10 people said they agreed. Five people said they neither agreed nor disagreed. Three people said they disagreed. Two people said they strongly agreed. Now, often you'll have a percentage or sometimes a proportion column there as well, and this one does. And this shows you the proportion or percentage of the overall uh, study here. So in that data set, we have 30 individuals represented, which is 100% of everybody. Because you say 30 is everybody, then that's 100%. And these 10 people represent 33% of the whole. Like These five people represent 16 and 2 thirds percent. These three people represent 10%, etc. So that's a common way of doing things. The percent helps you see kind of in a standard what standardized way what the distribution of values looks like. So here's another number, or another example, the number of computers per household in a whole bunch of households. Those are individual digits, by the way. Let's just assume that nobody had two-digit number of computers. So, so what kind of measurement is this? Anyway, just looking at these numbers, it's hard to make sense out of them. But turning them into a frequency table, suddenly everything kind of makes sense. Now, look at the zeros in this table, because that trips people up a lot. There are two zeros, and they both mean different things. Not the 0 and 106, that's just a placeholder. But there are two zeros in the table itself, values of zero. So pause this until you can figure out what those mean. If you can't figure it out, or if you're awesome and you already figured it out, then keep going. This zero means there was one household that reported owning zero computers. So there was a zero in the data. Let's go back here. Here it is. It's right here. Here's the zero in the data. That's what that zero means. But the other zero means something else. There are no sevens. Let's look back here. I think I'm right about that. There are no sevens. So nobody reported owning exactly seven computers. So we, But we put seven in the sequence anyway. We don't just skip from six to eight because you want to see the pattern. It's a matter of, of data honesty to represent all the possibilities and not leave out gaps in the middle of your sequence. So. Theoretically, someone might have had seven computers, but they didn't in this particular group. So we say zero. Here's some more information. It gets a little crazy. Um, but once you understand, it'll make some sense. First of all, percentage. This is the percentage of individuals. Now, whenever you see something that looks like percentage, you should check to see whether it's really percentage or whether it's proportion, because that can make a difference sometimes, and both are common. So in this case, it's actual percentage. You see the numbers go bigger than 1, so there's a 23.6. That's a percentage. And they add up to 100. So this is less than 1%. This is 23.6%, et cetera. And then you have cumulative frequency, and that is kind of adding everything as you go up. So when you get to the bottom, the cumulative frequency for the highest category after you're done is always the same as n, the total number of observations. So here, cumulative frequency at this number is 1. And at this number, now it's everything up here plus the new stuff, 5. So this plus the new stuff, now you're up to 30. So now you, some people really like this because you can see how things grow. When you get up here, it's not growing very much, very fast. But here it grows really fast, a big jump right there. Now both of those are turned into percents. The percent based on the frequency 
and cumulative percent based on the cumulative frequency. Now what if there are lots and lots and lots of categories? In numerical continuous systems, technically, there are an infinite number of categories. So we group them together. And to do that, we have to come up with a system for deciding on a number of bins, on a number of ranges. Uh, I'll show you how that works in a minute. And we have to count then how many observations fall in each of those ranges, for each of those bins. Now we want usually equal intervals in the ranges, but sometimes we could have numerical ones, like you could have the ranges going up on a logarithmic or an exponential scale or something to represent numbers that keep expanding like that. But they need to be equal or mathematically regular intervals. And you have to have really specific rules for deciding what the lowest and the highest points at each interval should be. Every possible value that you could observe needs to very clearly and without any confusion or questions fall into a specific interval in a really regular way. And one of the ways to lie with data is to mess with the intervals in a grouped frequency table and make some of them bigger than others and leave some out, things like this. Now, you don't usually have to worry about this. Software will do it for you. It might make you do it in class sometime just for the practice, but the software will usually do this for you. But you do need to know how to read these tables. So let's look at an ungrouped frequency distribution first. Here's an ungrouped frequency table of 71 students' grades. You can, in this case, uh, the person arranged the grades with the highest ones first. That's not the most common. It's usually the most common to start with low and then go higher. But you can see there's a lot of ones and a lot of zeros. This really could be condensed. If we're trying to see the, the overall pattern in the data, you could condense this a bit. Now you'll lose some information, though. So here's a grouped frequency table. Again, it's not really standard to have the highest numbers on the top and the lowest on the bottom, but they did that here, and that's OK. We just have frequency and percent. Now, this class interval goes from 95 to 99. Now, all we know is that there were three people in that interval, but we don't know if they were all 395s or all 399s or a 95, a 97, a 98. So that's the information you lose with a, with a grouped frequency table. You lose where the information was inside the interval, inside the, the bin or the cat or the range. That's a little note that isn't all that important. So let's look at some SAT scores and do another grouped frequency distribution. Pretty hard to make sense out of this, but here we go. Now it's more the more common method of starting low and going high as you go down the table. And the reason is because people do this by hand. This comes from doing things by hand, and you write the low ones first, and so as you go down the table, they get higher. And here you can see the frequency. Now look at this. You can even see that it's starting to form a bell-shaped curve just by the number of, of digits in the things you're writing. So that's pretty neat. And now here we have this CF and RF. These aren't percentages anymore. These are um, relative frequencies sometimes used for proportions. So a percentage would be 0.6%, but this percentage here would be 1.9%, etc. Just like percentages, it's just a couple of decim decimal places shifted. It's the same idea. You have frequencies, and then the relative frequency is the proportion of each category. And then cumulative frequency. And then instead of percentage, we have cumulative percentage, we have cumulative relative frequency. Some You'll see those tables from time to time if you consume a lot of data, and you should be able to figure them out. Now let's talk about data matrices. This is where we hold data for analysis. Usually there are multiple data columns that are placed side by side, usually in a computer. In fact, spreadsheets are awesome for that. And the data usually come from the same study. If you're going to put a bunch of data in a data matrix, you don't want to put one variable that you collected from 25 people on one side of town and another variable that's collected from some birds you observed in your backyard. You usually want one group of individuals, and you measured multiple characteristics. So you have multiple individuals or cases, and each of them was measured on the same characteristics, the same variables. So for instance, the individuals here are cars. There are 14 different car models. And notice this is not a variable. This is just a convenient way of indicating what's going on. You could treat it as a variable. You could say car model number is a variable, but it's nothing you would analyze. It's just a way to keep track of the cases. Sometimes you'd say a subject number is this kind of a variable. In the data set, it's a variable, but you're not going to treat it as a variable for statistical analysis. And we, we uh, collected two pieces of data about each car, the price of the car and the miles per gallon, the fuel efficiency. So you can see how we ordered this all together. Now, one variable is always located in one column. So this has two variables. It has price and miles per gallon. And then an individual case is in each row. So this is car number seven. 
and all of its information is in this row. So all the information about all the model's prices in this column, in each row you have information about an individual case, an individual subject, something like that. And every little cell is one particular observation. There we go. And keep in mind the variable name in the data set is not necessarily the name of the variable that you would use in a research sense trying to actually describe that variable in a paper. It might just be, like here, some crazy variable names that you use because they fit nicely in your data set. In a regular data matrix, you often have missing data, especially in behavioral sciences. The person didn't fill out the survey, they marked the A and the B bubble, and then drew a little picture of something pornographic in between them. You don't know how to do that, so you just leave it blank. So you often have some blank missing data, and we're not going to do very much with dealing with that except just showing you that it exists. Now with software, mostly it will deal with that for you. We often also have a, a variable names that are kind of strange and abbreviated, and we might even need to have a special document somewhat called a code book that tells us what those names mean uh, as real variable names, because the big long variable names don't fit. So this would be like treatment professional. Are you a treatment professional, yes or no? And those numbers are a little off there. I should have been more careful. We also sometimes have strange little data codes so that we can look at the page and make sense out of it. And so that in analyzing, we have some uh, small information pieces that we can use to analyze. In this case, WH means white and NW means non-white. A data matrix can have any number of rows or columns. It all depends on how much information you collected, how many individuals, and how, much, how many characteristics from each individual. Usually a data matrix in its early in its life is just the raw data. It's exactly what you observed in your study. You collected it from a survey, sometimes downloaded it straight from an online survey, or had a computer, you know, just pipe it straight into your data matrix. Sometimes you had an army of undergraduates entering it from scantrons or hand-filled questionnaires, etc. But in the data matrix, don't be surprised if you see some things that are not raw data. Like there might be one column of uh, answers to question one, and another column of answers to question two, and another one of answers to question three. That's raw data. And then you might see something that says um, 1 plus 2 plus 3, or scale score, where they added people's answers to 1, 2, and 3 together in a new column. Or you might standardize the values, turn numbers into percents, or convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, or something like that. So we kind of go crazy sometimes adding new variables to data matrices. So here's um, something to work with at the very end. See if you can answer these questions about this data matrix. And I'm going to stop this so that it stays at under 19 minutes so I can brag about my video being under 19 minutes. But you can pause this forever and answer these questions if you like.